Hey everybody, welcome to our weekly ecosystem office hours call. I am your host Jinx and we are joined as always with the best and brightest in the pocket ecosystem. I uh, want to start things off by handing the mic over to Zach uh, for any PNF based updates and then we'll go to Shane next. Yeah, thanks Jinx. Um, so I think people know uh, Token 2049 is happening this week. So Dermot is over there representing uh, pocket right now. Uh, we'll get an update when he comes back on the uh, the liquidity, the tier one liquidity that we've been talking about in the market makers. So thanks for your patience on that one. Uh, ben is also on vacation starting this week. So he's left for a bit. Um, we're trying to push everybody into the new cred system. So if anybody wants to help troubleshoot that, we have, a, we have quests in the Discord um, and then an open chat for anybody who's having any issues. So we are still in the, I'll say like, the beta stage of just making sure that the all the process works for everybody. So um, please give us feedback. Let me know if you have any issues. Um, and we're going to put that up for vote later this week. Um, we've had some great discussion in the forum. And definitely, if you have any more questions, we can take those here. But I think the majority of the issues that were brought up in the previous ecosystem meetings have been resolved, um, mostly around like constitutional changes and stuff. So a little shout out to Steve for bringing that to our attention. and. Um, helping us kind of separate the the things we need for the creds upgrade versus additional stuff, which we'll, uh, we will bring back up, I think, probably in a couple of weeks once the new cred system is up. Uh, trying to think through any other things. I think that's kind of the top of, top of list stuff we have going on. Yeah, I guess I'll pass it over to Shane. Great. Welcome back uh, after your honeymoon. Hope you all had a great time and... Uh... Has it been enough time to sync up to let us know where things are from a protocol perspective? Oh, sure. And uh, yeah, currently still in Guyana. Uh, it may actually be here a longer than expected, but uh, um, yeah. Uh, so if internet or audio is a bit flaky, that is probably the reason. Um, yeah, no, uh, plenty of time uh, to kind of re-get back into things. Uh, public testnet is pretty much fit pretty much expected for uh, three weeks from now is is what the current team is operating on. Uh, one of the big things that they're focused on is uh, building out and testing uh, governance parameters so that once we hit public testnet, uh, as, you know, we want to make changes, as, uh, you know, new parameters need to be tested, things of that nature, uh, we can have governance parameters or protocol parameters in general, uh, be able to be adjusted um, uh, without any issues. So that's one of the big focuses that they're doing right now. And that's kind of a really important one that has to be uh, that has to be fully functioning in order to have the public test net. Um, uh, another uh, thing they are going to be focused on is load testing. So uh, yeah, they, basically they've Put together quite an extensive load testing plan on the different things that need to be load tested and uh uh yeah they're they're going to be um uh kind of going through that to make sure that uh this is going to be ready for something like a public test map because uh kind of the idea is we don't want to don't want to release something that uh hasn't been tested uh for certain levels of traffic uh at least within you know within reason and uh, you know have surprises pop up so uh, so there's a lot of focus now on doing some load testing um, and uh, yeah that's there, you know there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that uh, they're working on uh, currently um, which all of it is also trackable in GitHub which is really cool um, they do a really good job using the project management uh, feature in GitHub so uh, yeah. I'm I'm only pulling out a few, but there's a number of uh, number of things that they're working on, and we did just hit a new um, uh, a new sprint or uh, a new iteration. So uh, for the next uh, yeah two weeks, they have specific um, yeah they have specific tasks for this next two weeks. So, anyways, that's pretty much uh, what's going on on the protocol side. So I'll uh, pass it on to you, Jinx. Unless there's Perfect. any questions. Yeah, are the majority of uh, node runners participating in the private test net now? No, no, it, it, no. Uh, we don't have uh, that. That's really what the public test net is for. Um, 
the private test net, uh, we had like four node runners uh, participating in it. So, uh, and, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't anything large scale. It was pretty much, uh, you know, run a few nodes, give us some feedback on the, the setup um, uh, and the documentation and things of that nature. Uh, the purpose of the public test net is to allow there to be a lot of node runners running it. Um, and uh, doing it in a fashion where uh, ideally the protocol team has already addressed a number of the, uh, you know, a number of the main issues that a lot of people would ask because once, once things go public and once a lot of node runners start getting involved, there's, you know, a lot of potential there to have a lot of support tickets, right? A lot of people providing feedback, a lot of questions, a lot of, and so if there's anything that's unclear, uh, you know, it, it'll, create uh, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of waste for the protocol team to have to deal with all that support. So that's the whole purpose of the public test net is everything's lined up so that you can onboard all these different node runners and not, uh, not eat into development time too seriously and be able to focus on things like actual uh, kind of network scale testing. Gotcha, yeah, keeping task management tight. Okay, cool. We'll be looking forward to hearing more updates from there. Any other questions about that? Excellent. Well, I'm going to keep it moving then. Um, Mr. DeVoto, as our uh, DAO observer, uh, any updates uh, or anything that uh, on your plate this week? Uh, hey, guys. So, so far, I've been onboarded. There's going to be, if you don't know, there's eight board meetings uh, per year, so two per quarter. So I'm sort of waiting for my first one. Um, so far, I've sort of mediated between some of the some of the community and PNF. So yeah, I'm sort of, I'm sort of still here to to listen to what people want to do, uh, listen to people's sort of thoughts, complaints, uh, home advice, what they want to want to push to PNF, and maybe kind of package that up and be able to kind of present it uh, more formally when the first board meeting kicks off, uh, which I think is relatively soon. But I'll have to wait for the dates. Yeah, so just kind of waiting for the first one to kick off and and taking it from there. Awesome, thank you, sir. And uh, over on the gateway side, uh, Fred, Gabby, any updates from y'all or just Fred? What's that, right? Uh, from our perspective, uh, we just launched a uh, new chain yesterday. We launched Fraxtal. Um, we are still kind of in a shaky phase on the three test nets, so Arbitrum, Sepolia, Optimum, Sepolia, and Amoy. Um, so we're working through that. Um, other than that, I don't have much to share. Fantastic. All right, is there, are you looking for more Node Runner uh, support for those test nets? Ideally, yes. Um, we're working through some updates to our QoS system to try to help, but um, with only 30 nodes, uh, which is just our minimum bootstrap node set, uh, it's not where we want it to be. And the quality was a little bit better. It looked like someone staked 500 plus nodes and then unstaked them. Um, so it was it was definitely better for a very brief stint while those were staked. So we're we're still investigating. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you, sir. I see uh, Blades has joined us this week. Y'all got any updates on the Nodi side? Uh, yeah. We've had some updates on the Gateway server. Um, so I uh, I think last week. Or two weeks ago, I highlighted the QoS nodes endpoint, which basically shows node runners data, uh, quality of service data. And now we pass that data over to PocketScan, and they're going to be working on a new project. Uh, they're going to be working on a project to restore the quality of service data or the geo region tab on PocketScan.com. Uh, no estimates on timelines there, but you know, we're definitely thinking about how can we restore that functionality so that way node operators know how they're performing, uh, which then, you know, in return kind of help improves the quality of service of the entire network, right? Because they can then restore uh, whatever errors they have. Uh, some other things that uh, that worth to note is that speaking to the foundation about Solana support and uh, some other chain support, I think we're kind of reaching towards the end of that conversation. So I'll have some more concrete updates on that soon. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, and sorry, who was that that just unmuted? 
there's a lot of you. That was me. I don't think I have any other updates. Okay, cool. Uh, Ramiro, any updates on the uh, AI side of the house that you'd like to put out? Uh, regarding the uh, AI group, we are working. No, nothing new. This week we'll start actually doing the writing, so we expect next week to have some more information, but everything's running smooth, so nothing to, to show just yet. Excellent. Cool. I think that's all of the major updates out here. So uh, we can open it up to uh, open QA. If anybody has a topic they'd like to bring up, just go ahead and jump off mute and jive on in. I could go first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get more in the loop of all the AI stuff that's happening around Pocket right now. Um, you know, is this AI model or this AI testing being done on Morse or Shannon? And when no? It should be on Shannon. Uh, sorry, on Morse, but it depends on gateways and. I think group can give us an update. They have uh, been putting up some kind of form for people who want nodes, AI nodes. So maybe you can tell us something, group. Yeah, um, I'm not the expert on this, but I can speak very briefly. Uh, we are still soliciting um, potential partners on the demand side. We're interested and we're still sifting through them we want to make sure that we have committed partners because we just want to we have we there's a lot of unknown unknowns as we get on this path so we want to make sure whoever's going to be working with us is going to be sensitive to that and be able to work through some of that with us gotcha you know some folks have asked us uh no deeds about whether we'll be rep uh supporting like kind of like the ai models and whatnot and we're definitely open to it i think it's just more of a function of kind of like what kind of hardware do we need um kind of like what kind of uh yeah what kind of hardware are we sourcing for the initial testing and whatnot be great to kind of have like a baseline idea of you know, kind of like you know what hardware should we invest into what hardware should we rent uh look into different file providers or dedicated providers on uh these these different types of hardware to start looking towards say a100s h100s fours etc yeah it's probably if you're not in there now you should join the ai chat channel uh, on the in the discord uh, because there's multiple initiatives that are going on and you know everybody can participate in each of them or all of them as the case may be um, there's documentation of the methods in uh, open in, uh, open api spec format um, there are the various uh, experiments with uh, both RAG and uh, uh, inference models. And, you know, a lot of this stuff doesn't have any additional hardware requirement at all. It's just operating within the constraints of uh, a traditional pocket node with some, you know, upgrades and gateway support in particular. So, love to have your input. Yeah, I, I wanted to add that there is no need for a specific, for example, you don't need a hundred H one hundred to to run a, an inference node. So it really depends on the model that you want to to put on the network. And uh, we are not going to be very specific on that. So you could put a node with a single thirty sixty. I don't know, and a small uh, GPU will be enough to handle a model of, I don't know, uh, a Mixtral 7 billion, for example. And, and that's good enough for simple tasks. So it will all depend on the demand, on what are the requirements of the initial demand that we will have. So I, I would not expend a lot of money getting a cluster of H100s, for example. Not right now, at least. Makes sense, makes sense. Cool. Uh, uh, chime in more into the AI chat. Sounds good. Sweet. 
other topics? This is y'all's call, so I'm just happy to sit here in silence if you like, share the space with you. Well, I love the silence. Um, I guess I can ask, we had a great office hours last week um, where we talked a bit about like making a bridge to base. So I guess, James, maybe I can just give a little update to you here that we've reached out to a couple of teams to see what it would cost. And it no. actually, assuming, assuming that it's um, as easy as they say it is, it seems like it's very cost efficient and uh, not overly complicated. So I'm hoping to have an update by the end of the week for um, a process to, to bridge to base. That would be amazing. And that was a great call for anybody who didn't hear that last week. Uh, make sure you check out the recording, which I think get put out on YouTube. Uh, I don't know the, the intention. Maybe I can be clear about this is the intention for the office hours, which happened later today is for them to be really uh, free form. Like I feel like often we don't have the space to brainstorm and just kind of like shoot the shit and figure out what people are thinking about. Um, Cause there's structured calls. Not that this one's super structured, but, for me, it was really great because we did get to just kind of like, I don't know, there was no real purpose to it. So I don't <laughs> plan recording them unless we really want to record them um, because there's not anything that's going to come out of them that we don't then put into writing um, as like a formal proposal or something. Oh, yeah, Does that, that makes, makes sense. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So if you're not joining the free form office hours calls uh, from four to six, then you're not going to hear that. Yeah, and let me just be clear that it, it. I feel like a lot of people reach out one on one to get foundation time, and I don't know if we give um, everybody the opportunity they want to just come up with thoughts, ideas, or questions. So it really is meant to be like pop in, um, get some feedback on maybe like a grant proposal or uh, some things you're thinking about as far as like projects or test net. It's mostly me in there every week, and Ben's been joining me, but I'm trying to get uh, everybody to commit to one week a month. So having Shane, you know one Wednesday a month join us would be really great. So we're just trying to figure out the format for that, but it really is meant to be like, do you need foundation time? Are you not getting the attention you need? Um, you have us for, for two hours during that, that open office. Yeah, it was a fun time just kind of having the, the free form space to brainstorm and, you know, just kind of talk in general uh, versus, uh, you know, something more structured. Yeah, it was, it was fun, which was, um, you know, it's nice to be able to just be ourselves and not be recorded. So uh, it was it was fun to spend the time with everybody and hopefully it'll keep going well and we'll um, we'll continue to get more people showing up and pitching ideas and finding ways to make them happen. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If, if you want to, you know, if you've got some oddball idea that you want to bounce off some folks uh, um, with like zero concern about... <laughs> the greater community at large, uh, uh, analyzing it in the moment. That's definitely the space to do it. Uh, Wojtek asked, was there MM liquidity update yet? Um, yeah, Zach uh, said at the beginning that uh, uh, Dermot is in Dubai this week. Um, and that we'll have an update uh, next week, I believe. Also, going off of that conversation from last week, I was reading through a lot of proposals and different things in the forum, and I did see there was a comment that Dermot had made on one of his posts that one of the reasons why they were looking to choose initially Arbitrum over Base, at least back when he had posted this, was that Base would require more coordination and planning as it would require the whitelisting of Wrap Pocket on Ethereum before it will be allowed to be transferred via its bridge. This is doable, but most likely post Shannon. Um, I'm not sure if that's changed since he's posted that, but that may be something to kind of dig into or ask about if, uh, if that's happened, the whitelisting of Wrap Pocket on Ethereum, because that's what's needed for base liquidity. Zach, is that on your list? 
How does one whitelist on Ethereum? What does that mean? Those are great questions. Um, it's on my list now. <laughs> yeah, it's it. That's interesting because, um, like I said, we did put out a proposal, and people haven't come back to say that's an issue. So um, that's a great question, Dan, and I will definitely come back to you all with that. Yeah, I just remember there was something, and uh, I dug it up by searching back for it. It was a, a while ago. I think that he posted. I'll send you the link to the forum where he mentioned that just so you can see the full kind of context of that too, but yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, appreciate that. Personally, I've never had to get a chain or a whitelisted on Ethereum, so I have no idea. Other topics, other questions? Thresh has uh, reminded us that Dubai has a ton of liquidity right now. Seeing videos of uh, two foot deep water in the middle of the desert is certainly something. Uh, yeah, I, I've got a question. So I'm uh, Benedictus from the Porter's Gateway team. Yep. And we would like to bring on a new chain to pocket um so it is Tyco. Tyco is currently um in a testnet phase but the main net is expected um around mid end of may so nice. we, we would like to bring Tyco on as soon as the main net is live and are seeking node runner support and wanted to make this um would bring it to the attention of the community. Um, any hints, um, things that we need to keep out or, um, yeah, need to do. Fantastic. Well, you've got a, a good selection of folks on here who are deeply in that space and would be part of that process. Um, I'd, I would suggest that's probably, Shane, are you taking any part in, in organizing that or is that just straight up normally through uh, foundation, um, general foundation process combined with uh, gateway support. Yeah, to add new chains, um, at least right now, it's uh, predominantly on the side of gateways. So gateways come to us because they're the ones that make it accessible, right? So a gateway will come and say, hey, we, uh, we'd like to whitelist this, uh, this chain and PNF just uh, you know, coordinates with that gateway to whitelist it. Um, and then the gateway, you know, how they make that chain, uh, you know, how they do quality of service for that chain is pretty much up to that gateway. Grove will, um, you know, bootstrap, uh, you know, work with other node runners to bootstrap uh, in initial, um, initial nodes for that gateway. And then, uh, yeah, for, for their gateway to have a uh, good quality of service before they launch a chain. Um, but other gateways may operate differently. So at least right now, it's it's more a, uh, that is a, uh, it is the gateways that bring new chains um, because they're the ones that uh, either believe they have opportunity in that chain or something like that. But um yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, I can comment here as the person who has launched the last 50 chains on the network. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not to toot my own horn, but yeah, Benedictus, uh, shoot me a DM and we can discuss some of the logistics here. Um, we have not, there has not been a case, at least in the last 50 chains, where a chain has not been launched in conjunction with a gateway. It is a permission process through the foundation. Um, yeah, so there's, there's some details that need to be worked out. Um, Certainly, you could approach the foundation and get your chain listed on Paga Network, but that doesn't mean that a gateway is necessarily going to pick it up and list it on their user interface, which means that it's very difficult for an end user to actually use your chain. So, uh, like I said, just DM me and we'll, we'll start a conversation. Thank you. Already did. Perfect. Yeah, I will note that yeah, with Shannon, um, there's going to be new 
possibilities with people being able to onboard uh, new chains uh, really permissionlessly in a really efficient way. So uh, that that's gonna that's likely what's gonna be changing a lot from going from Morse to Shannon is uh, uh, folks might not be as um, reliant on e existing gateways to uh, get a new chain launched. Perfect, and we'll look forward to some uh, updated documentation that helps clarify all of that. You know, uh, just thinking about some more, kind of going back to your original question, Benedict, about you know how can we get it properly supported on Pocket Network? This is something I spoke to about Sasquatch. I think I was speaking to Sasquatch, which is also from Ray Guild, on some other tips and tricks on making sure that it's appropriately uh, supported. But, um, you know, uh, it, oftentimes, I think that good chain support is often like a social consensus amongst node operators and gateway operators. Obviously, there's some coordination to go through. And one of the things that I know for sure, especially from node running for so long as well, is that, you know, we love in-depth instructions on, you know, what hardware requirements does it take to run this chain. And uh, are we running a pruned? Are we running an archival? And then, you know, one of the most favorite things I love to see whenever I spin up these nodes is like a already created Docker Compose file. So that way I could easily spin it up. Um, and if you could provide those to the node operators, then I have without no doubt that you will have node operators supporting you in that chain. Thank you so much. Yeah, Go ahead, Ben. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the guidance. And especially the last part is important and um, very noteworthy. So we'll we'll make sure that all these things are put together and in place so that we can hand this out um, as soon as it's quiet. Yeah, I think it's a, it'll be interesting to see if uh, if we move forward with the uh, one chain per node uh, architecture that Shane has uh, um, proposed in the past. Um, to see like the kind of work that needs to be done from a social uh, contract aspect uh, in getting uh, node runner support for those chains, since there will be a lot more total nodes, I would guess, being managed on a regular basis uh, to support each of the the chains that are uh, whitelisted on the network. So, kind of curious to see how that evolves in the future. Yeah, and kind of to expand on that, that's the that's the real benefit that we can get from a network uh, by having one chain uh, per one pocket node is basically uh, any new chain, uh, if they already have folks that are running uh, that chain's node um, in their own community, they can then add it to the pocket network and start serving relays. So. Right now, a new chain basically has to go to existing, uh, or and and it, it's a little, it's a little confusing. Which is, uh, yeah, what, uh, why, uh, Fred, uh, you know, kind of mentioned, uh, you know, DMing him, and there's a lot of coordination that goes on because, you know, you basically have to get existing node runners to support a new chain. Um, but the idea with Shannon going completely permissionless is, uh, and going permissionless on top of one node to one chain is this actually opens the door for new communities to join Pocket. So an existing chain already has <laughs> node running community, potentially. Uh, they could all just uh, drop a Pocket node right next to their existing chain and start generating reward from uh, uh, serving relays. Um, so you, you wouldn't have to go through an existing node runner to get, uh, to get support on the Pocket network. Um, existing communities or existing experts in that chain could uh, could actually be the ones to initially bootstrap uh, a new chain uh, by just putting up the nodes that they already run on the pocket network. So anyway, that's, that, that is the advantage of going to one chain, one node uh, in the pocket network. Um, we can target those kind of specialists uh, and those kind of niche communities. Um, that are already running games 
uh, that we want to add to Pocket. Yeah, shifting uh, supply side to be uh, more community based in the new chains that are coming on will certainly be a, a change in the overall uh, community architecture, so to speak, as well. It'd be interesting to see a lot of these other communities begin to join our conversations and contribute, you know, some some chain side, some demand side feedback on a regular basis into the development that we do as a community. We don't have anywhere near enough of that, in my opinion. And we did have that early on. Uh, we had a nice bump in uh, new node runners joining when we uh, partnered with the Avalanche uh, Foundation to, uh, to add Avalanche because uh, we were able to promote to their community, hey, if you're already running a node, just uh, put a uh, pocket node next to your existing node and you can generate rewards. And so we actually got a, a nice bump in uh, folks moving literally from Twitter spaces and from uh, things we were doing in their community, uh, of folks literally joining Pocket um, and starting to run Pocket nodes alongside their Avalanche nodes. Uh, we also had a similar thing happen with Harmony. So yeah, no, there, it, it, there, there is a lot of enthusiasm uh, that we've seen in the past with uh, you know having a place for these uh, communities of other chains to monetize within Pocket. Um, you can't really do that now because you have to run 14 ch other chains in order to uh, generate network average, which is, you know, the big challenge. But um, yeah, in the uh, uh, in the future, we should be able to retap. Again, we're basically retapping into a, a strategy that uh, had some great fruits in the past. Yeah, I think when when we look at uh, a potential future where we have you know hundreds of thousands of pocket nodes around the world, um, it would absolutely be driven by people adding pocket to the existing um, nodes that they're supporting. And somebody asked me yesterday about the the current status of small form factor like desktop node node boxes. I'm guessing they get better and better by the year. I haven't seen any major updates on that front. Um, but if all it has to do is take an existing network node and just provide access to Pocket for it, uh, that makes it a hell of a lot easier for even small chains. Or you know, if, if you've got a hundred users of your chain uh, and every one of them's got a node of some sort, then that could be a reasonable addition to Pocket Network. So I'm looking forward to seeing all that. Yeah, hey, Avalanche uh, is, oh, sorry, go for it. Yep. I was just going to say, it's, uh, Kemp here from Developer DAO, really nice to be on the call for the first time. Um, we're kind of in a similar situation to what the, um, the Ray Guild team suggested in working with chains to kind of bring them to market through sort of test net, through to mainnet, which is including more now running validators sort of through that process as well and we would obviously love to be able to have the value out of providing rpcs and on board these chains uh who are partnering with us um into the pocket network so it'd be great maybe that's fred if if it's kind of the same question that was asked earlier but it'd be great to understand more about how we might be able to align there where if we're um partnering with these foundations and DAOs to kind of bring these chains to market, how we might then make the connection between what we're already doing, running validators, creating sort of education and incentive campaigns, and then also bringing them to Pocket Network so we can provide RPCs and sort of grow the, the change in Pocket Network too. Yeah, I think that's the one challenge in, in adding new chains. And the reason that we're at 40 instead of 500 right now is simply because on a lot of these you know, I, I'm not I'm not calling them like micro chains, but, you know, much smaller total active user base. Uh, it's difficult to get uh, an existing pocket node runner to use the resources to add that. But every chain that has, you know, 10 validators running on it should have 10 pocket nodes attached to those, in my opinion.
I see Kemp is typing in chat. And of course, for anybody who isn't familiar, if if you can't come off mute for whatever reason, but you want to add a thought, feel free to uh, add it to the sidebar chat. We'll read it out. Yeah, that's really interesting to see how it changes when it comes to Shannon. I haven't digged in to like the logistics or lift of onboarding um, for the new change with RPCs, but like one on one ongoing partnership at the moment where we're running validators of Saga, for example. It's similar to the Tyco question from uh, from the Ray Guild team earlier, like what would it look like and kind of who do we need to speak to about whether or not we can kind of bridge that and bring Saga and potentially well our validator and potentially other validators from Saga to Pocket to, um, to onboard new chains. And then also kind of for other L2s coming to market that we're doing a similar kind of um, work with, like if we can get a good idea of what that needs to look like and maybe like if there's like incentives that need to be aligned or anything, that would be great to kind of dig into that and we can kind of hopefully factor it into the work that we're already doing that includes running these validators and, and help bring, bring some more, uh, more chains to the network. Yeah, now that we've passed a model that allows for... Um you know, a, a per chain uh, reward system or per chain fee, uh, we really do have some opportunities in the future to have a secondary economy that is driving or incentivizing, um, supporting some of these smaller chains because it has a higher reward base. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see how that economic system develops. We haven't, we don't really have it um, active yet, but it is passed. Yeah, for both developer DAO, you know, and Raid Guild, um, uh, yeah, I, I would say uh, be sure to reach out to uh, to PNF, uh, you know, and myself, uh, because there are, are certainly ways, especially if you already have nodes, um, uh, like validators that are running, uh, and you want to use those for RPC. There certainly are ways to bootstrap existing chains. Um, if you already have nodes that are potentially running, and that might be where uh, that might be where uh, you partner with a uh, um, partner uh, with a node runner uh, who uh, you know could potentially have node the existing pocket nodes that we can point to your existing validator nodes. So there, there's absolutely ways that uh, you know. Uh, Chains can be onboarded in Shannon or in in Morse. Um, so yeah, and especially if uh, uh, you know folks like Raid are building their own gateway, um, you know they could uh, they could actually yeah. There's, there's a lot of potential there uh, for sure. So uh, definitely definitely reach out to uh, myself and and PNF and we can help you through some of the strategies uh, or and some of the things that would be needed to make that possible. But um, yeah, things do get exponentially more efficient and easier in Shannon, but it's still very possible at Morse, which is why Grove has been so successful with uh, launching chains through their gateway, um, you know, in the past and present. Beautiful. The gateway verse is definitely going to be an evolving uh, landscape. Well, we're coming up near the top of the hour now. Any final thoughts or questions or topics we haven't covered yet? Hey, uh, yeah, I just had a question. It might not be the right time for it either, but I see that Shane is here and. I also see Pocket News is here. I, I I follow Pocket News on Twitter and get updates from there. So I'm just wondering, like, how do we take the information that we hear in these meetings and then use it later on for, you know, community updates? Do we have, like, a system for that? Uh, again, this might not be the right place to ask this question. No, it's perfectly fine. This is an ecosystem call, so anything related to the greater ecosystem is welcome here. Uh, I can give a quick answer here since I know Pocket News won't come off mute. <laughs> they uh, they have a DAO grant that uh, um, is used to fund um, 
turning a lot of this information into news as it happens. So you'll see that uh, for every major call, um, they generally have a tweet thread that is uh, an explainer for that call. Um, sometimes, you know, 20, 30 tweets long if need be to cover all the major things that were uh, talked about. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, our most formalized method. Um, but we also do record these calls and publish them out. Um, and then discuss them afterwards in uh, our various community channels. Uh, so that's that's sort of the community architecture of it, I believe. Uh, does that answer the question? Okay, yeah, that does. It gives me an idea of what's going on. Thank you for explaining. And nice to meet everyone here. Uh, I know a lot of you, but uh, for those I don't know, nice to meet you. I'm helping Pocket with the website maintenance. And yeah, I'm happy to be here. Nice. Well, welcome. Good to have you. Any other uh, final points or thoughts before we close out? We'll call that a wrap then. We'll see you all again, uh, same time, same channel next week and uh, talk soon. Bye. Thanks everybody. Thanks.